Scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. Today's story, Scotty Kemp. Hello there. Do you remember Scotty Kemp? If you're like most folks, you'll have to roll that name around a while before you can piece it all together. Scotty Kemp, a little man with a Liverpool brogue and a roll to his walk that could only have come from years at sea. He smoked a stub of clay pipe clamp in a pugnacious jaw and draped with a ragged mustache. He scuffed along the streets of our communities followed by his mud of a dog named Rowdy. Scotty Kemp was known to everyone on Grace Harbor's sprawling, rattling waterfront as a man who knows the sea. They didn't know much about him except that he kept the harbor posted on its weather by hauling aloft the weather flags each morning. Do you remember Scotty? His might of frame making up Heron Street against the stiff rain squalls, his black rain clothes shredding water, and his seagoing gait striking a line down the middle between a man who loves the sea and a man who's content with the land. So tonight our scrapbook is open to a page that tells the story of Scotty Kemp, a friend of ours who has been gone from the harbor for 10 years now, by rule of thumb reckoning, but who's well worth recalling as more than passing interest to those who remember the Grays Harbor scene of other years. So when Dick Crombie has said a few words from our sponsor, we'll renew our acquaintance with this picturesque little Scott who called Grays Harbor home for a quarter of a century and make himself a useful and colorful citizen in our hometown of yesterday. But first, Dick Crombie and a word from our sponsor. Before Grace Harbor knew the likes of Scotty Kemp, the world had known him. And two of them, Scotty and the world, seemed to have hit it off pretty well. And to judge from the tales that Scotty spun, the two had become pretty well acquainted. If we tight today for a guidepost and do some reckoning in time. It would have been about 70 years ago that Scotty Kemp of Liverpool took a hankering to a fancy ship with the name of Actor, done in gilt lettering under his counter. And it wasn't many years later that the first mate under the sailing ship came out of the hold leading a slip of a lad by one year and stood him before the old man quivering with black with an accumulated grime of ship's innards. Scotty was 13 and that feeling that comes over lads at that age that there must be more to see in the world than you can see from the inside of a ship had come over him. He stowed away in the bunkers of the ship and was determined that they come what may, he'd stick it out. But the gnawing of his belly and the realization that some of the world was slipping past unseen brought him out of hiding, and right there the mate took over. The skipper was a man of few words. He whacked the young fellow a few lively belts, gave a one-sentence lecture on the subject and consternation for other folks, and sent him packing to the galley to scour the ship's pots and pans all the way to a place called New Orleans and back again to Liverpool. Ending, as it did, right where it had started, made it an incomplete voyage for the runaway lad, but it showed him what he could do. And from that day on, until he settled on Grace Harbor's waterfront, he was seeing the world. Scotty Kemp was born in Dumfries, Scotland, and when very young, he moved with his family to Liverpool and fell under the influence of the sea and the Irish. Both of them shaped his life, he once figured about equally. The Irish with their carefree perspective of things as they are and the sea with its tug 
to be moving on to where other waters lap at other piers and posts, and the shafts of sun and squalls and rain play over new visits into strange places. From the Irish, Scotty learned the importance of trade, not bricklaying, but another Irish skill that ranks high in the curriculum of the air and born as the stacking of ashlar for cottage walls. It was boiling making, boiler making, and between flings at sea, Scotty became the first class hand at the business. But every time he settled down and took up the pen hammer and chisel, he had the urge to swap the ring of hammers in his ear for the sweet slop sound of the wind in a sail. And the yearning always sent him back to the salt water. There was the Clitty out of Liverpool in 1883 and the Vanderhura out of the same port two years later. And to his last days, the wee bit of Scotsman carried the name of a lifetime friend in his files in his mind, and all because he shipped on the Vanderhura. Like some other surprising things that happened to people, it came about because Scotty Camp smacked a man on the jaw. Now folks on Grace Harbor who knew Scotty Camp wondered about the little man reaching for the bearded chin with the rounded house haymaker, but Scotty was young and filled with the impulse of youth when this happened. And this is how he recalled it. Scotty was a mite slow tumbling out of the bunk one morning for a watch, and the ship's mate helped him with the soul-jarring boot to the beam. Scotty picked himself up off the deck and swung at the mate's chin. It was a neat connection, Scotty recalled, but with the full weight of his little puncher behind it, the blow was not the kind that left the man spread on the planking. The mate tossed his head and lay to to give the jaunty Scotsman a, wor a working over. That he did, Scotty recalled his last, and laid from Liverpool, woke up in the scuppers with a face like a quarter of a beef that was butchered and had been served in apprenticeship on. Scotty never struck another mate, but as those things sometimes turn out, they forgot the incident and became fast friends. It was in 1886 that Scotty sailed the Amazon. It was on the Liverpool running from the Great River from Para to Manos through 1,500 miles of the greatest jungle known to man. And in those days, as Scotty often recalled, the jungles of the Amazon were really something. For 26 years after that voyage, Scotty carried jungle fever in his veins. On the long voyage home to Liverpool, the ship's company slipped one Englishman over the side, and three other had been left behind, unable to make the trip because of their condition. There was only one threat one treatment, Scotty remembers. It was quinine and plenty of it. In 1898, Scotty was firing the boilers for the Liverpool Tramp and the Atlantean, the steamer that was a day out of Galveston, Texas, when the tidal wave hit it head on, the same devastating wave that destroyed Galveston's waterfront a few hours later. The locked outside, the big comer, and gave the skipper time to point the ship's nose into the wave, but it broke over the decks in a deluge, carrying away the rigging and the small boats and powering six feet of water down the hatches into the engine room and stokehold. Scotty, as you'll recall, was no tall man, but he could find nothing to stand on that would lift him above the waterline. He hitched a ride on the ship's ladder on the back of the towering Irishman and fell off when the Celt started up the ladder and bumped Scotty's head at the narrow hatch. Scotty saved himself, however, without the aid of Paddy Doran, whose name he never forgot. And in 1901, the man who was to become one of Grace Harbor's best-known waterfront characters gave, the sea, gave up the sea and went to work at his trade in the Quincy shipyard. When the yard went down, he took a shift with the boiler work in, the, in New York.
but he couldn't find his way around the big city and pulled out for New Orleans. He longed short for a time and made his next stop at San Francisco, where he lived there for a dozen years. But men who have gone down to sea never managed to get it out of their system. And in 1913, Scotty got the yen to walk along Waterloo Road and stand again on the Collinwood Dock to pat the cold grain of iron on the time gun at Walsley Landing and to spit in the River Morsey. You guessed it, Scotty Camp shipped out of Liverpool and a look at home, a look that was to be his last. But it was not an old man going to die, not Scotty. First, he was no old man. He was hale and fit, and he had had his fling in the Blighty. He sailed again on a ship and dropped anchor off Seattle, and that was the way that Grays Harbor found him, roaming in every larger circle from Seattle's waterfront until they found a place that suited his style. He followed his trade for a time and worked for several of the metal shops in the harbor, but the waterfront kept tugging at him, and finally he fitted out a small house on the dock behind what is now the Soffer Bowman Company, and through his acquaintance with Captain Benham, pioneer of Grace Harbor Waterfront, Scotty got the job of tending the Weather Bureau's store mornings. And there he lived, making his trip uptown and paying his social calls on schedule, always followed by Rowdy, the French bull he, who rolled himself into a black ball in front of the cook stove when Scotty was brewing a mulligan or waiting at the door for the master when the old salt was pulling on his oil skins for a jump through the harbor drizzle. Where Scotty went, Rowdy went. Grace Harbor knew the two as one, though it's tough to more than half a dozen men who knew the name of Camp. He was Scotty to the harbor, and one of those figures out of our past who helped us create the aura of romance, adventure that clung to our waterfront in this very part of it. And now we'll turn the pages, and here's a few seconds and a few words from our sponsor. It's been nearly 10 years since Scotty Kemp stubbed a clay pipe got cold from lack of use and the boys' size oil skins that turned the weather season in and the seasons out were hung up for the last time. Scotty had lived 75 years and his sea-weathered face with its British mustache was a familiar sight to local folks as the Cosmopolis streetcar or the March rain squalls. During his last year, Scotty attended exclusively to his weather duties. When the wind was a little gusty, there was a feel of a gale in the air. When the rain leaned a sharp rake on the harbor's face scowled, Scotty would walk the short piece from his shaft to the foot of the steel weather bureau tower and hoist the flags and pennants to the masthead. And uptown and down harbor or across the bay, Men who watched the whimsy of the weather would pick up their glasses and train them on the fluttering flags and comment on turn of how the weather has changed, noting perhaps that Scotty Kemp was a right smart in posting his flags that morning. And Scotty would tell about his work, though after half a lifetime in Aberdeen soil, he still had trouble with his H's in a Liverpoolian sort of way, dropping them out where they ought to have been, and throwing them in where none should have been added. A very noticed, a very few noticed that Scotty Kemp had slipped away from us. Many would have missed him had his death been properly reported, but it was in the first months of the late great national emergency that people were concentrating on other things, and Scotty quietly gave it all up and elbowed his way amongst his friend to Fiddler's Green, where good sailors go, and left us a salty recollection of a brisk little man with a sea-going roll and a note for a hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening.